Okay, so before we start, there's a few things to really fully understand, and we talked about this a bit before, so I'll be, be, I'll be brief, but the uh, anatomy is super important when it comes to understand this. So in the shoulder, there's something called your subacromial space, all right? And I'll bring my pointer over here, and I'll show you where this is. But if you look at the arrow, this is where your subacromial space is right here, okay? If we look at the objects right here, we have a humerus, which is this ball right here, okay? And we have the acromion, which is this little piece right above it, okay? We have the coracoid, which sits a little bit lower right here. And we have the coracoacromial arch, which sits between the two, just like this, okay? And underneath of this forms the subacromial space. Now, in the subacromial space, you can see a little bit more here, which again, is this space right here. We have a couple important structures. We have the supraspinatus tendon, which you can see right here. There's a picture of the tendon that's torn. I think it's important to understand when you have a, a rotator cuff tear, it's actually of the tendon itself, and it's not going to be of the muscle belly, per se. And that's a, a common misunderstanding, okay? Uh, the next one is going to be the long head of the biceps, which you can see comes across right through here, all right? Just like this. We also have a bursa, and that's not depicted, but it's also right in this area. And those are the soft tissues that are important in subacromial and pinterest syndrome. Okay. Next, I want to talk a little bit about acromion types, because this is going to affect in pinterest syndrome, and potentially it also is going to affect people that are going to be able to do more overhead work versus not. All right. So if we look right here, this is your chromium. Okay. This is the coracoid that like we talked about before. This is a coracoacromial arch like we talked about in the last slide. And then this is going to be the socket or the glenoid and the ball is just removed, all right? The important thing here is the chromium. And in some individuals, the chromium is bigger than in others, all right? Some individuals have a flat chromium, some people have a curved chromium, and then some people have what's called a hooked chromium. The hooked chromium is just a little bit bigger, and it kind of goes downward into subacromial space. Now, this is important because our medical literature shows that the um, hooked chromium is more associated with subacromial and pigeon syndrome, it's also more associated with rotator cuff damage over time. Uh, what's not really clear is that the amount of damage that you have in the shoulder doesn't always correlate with pain, okay? Which is kind of a, a tricky thing to understand. Uh, however, our literature shows that if you've got more of a hooked chromium, you're probably gonna have more wear and tear or injury to the rotator cuff over time. That doesn't always mean that you end up with pain, okay? My own personal thoughts are that in these studies, they're not necessarily high-level athletes, and I'm, I'm just curious if they, they looked at them a chromium morphology uh, in individuals that were doing a whole bunch of overactivity all the time. Um, but keep that in mind. So a chromium is important, but however, the research is a little bit mixed in this regard. Okay. Next thing we want to talk a little bit about are the capsule and the labrum. And we're going to refer to these uh, oftentimes as a passive restraint to motion. And what that means is that your capsule and labrum do not contract. They're not like a muscle in that regard. They're not actually uh, shortening and providing stability to the shoulder joint the same way that the rotator cuff does. All right. However, the capsule and the labrum seek to deepen and also to stabilize the joint. So if the ligaments, the capsule, so the capsule is a series of ligaments that surround the shoulder joint. If these are nice and strong, then they're going to help to deepen and stabilize the joint. All right. The other piece, and this is important, is that the capsule and the labrum can be stretched out, right? Sometimes to the point where you have some tearing of the labrum. You see this in shoulder dislocation patients. Uh, we also see this in throwers. So throwers, professional throwers, baseball throwers, there's a lot of labral pathology. And we think because there's so much stress on the joint, what ends up happening is that the labrum gets stressed, stressed, stretched, and then it gets torn over time, right? Um, the other point is that some people are naturally looser than others. Some people just have more motion within the capsule that just is a little bit uh, less stable. And because of that, that's going to change sometimes the way we mobilize certain individuals. Some people are going to actually have true capsular stiffness. Some people are going to have more soft tissue stiffness limitations. And we just can't really stretch the heck out of someone who has a capsule limitation. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. 